Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space News with me. Tons to talk about today, from fiery booster tests at Starbase, alongside major demolition work at the Starship production site, two successful missions to the International Space Station, another launch failure from North Korea, Rocket Lab leaps one step closer to booster reuse, and India successfully lands on the lunar South Pole. All of this and so much more. Seriously, this last week has been super jam-packed, so let's jump right in. We left off last week's episode of Space This Week with Booster 9 still in the Mega Bay, preparing to be rolled out to the launch pad for further static fire testing with its newly installed hot staging ring attached to its top. The day after the episode went live, on Tuesday the booster was rolled down to the highway, hopefully for the final time before its orbital launch, and placed next to the launch mount after completing the two hour drive. Shortly afterward, the chopsticks hooked the Super Heavy by its lifting hardpoints, raised it up and then placed it onto the pad. What was interesting about this lift was that, ordinarily, we'd be able to see the engines, but this time, all 33 Raptors were covered up. Hmm. Anyway, I know what you guys care about more, last week's static fire test, though SpaceX needed to perform a couple of pre-tests before this, which all took place on Wednesday. First up, it underwent a Raptor igniter test, followed by a test of the FireX detonation suppression system. After this, the booster was partially filled before performing a brief spin prime test of its engines, which brings the turbo pumps up to speed and allows fuel to flow, but doesn't involve ignition. Anyway, the main event took place on Friday. SpaceX booted up the live streams, and we saw the water deluge system fire up, and then there it goes. We late had confirmation that all 33 Raptors ignited, with the static fire lasting the full duration. In the end, only two engines shut down prematurely, which means that this would have got to orbit if it were a real launch, provided no more than one other engine shut down during the ascent. What's more, it looked like the pad held up well, no rock tornado was generated, and with the success of this test, both Booster 9 and Ship 25 have now presumably passed all the pre-flight required tests for the second Starship orbital launch. SpaceX tweeted that the test produced approximately 7.9 million pounds of thrust, or around 3,600 metric tons. That's a lot, right? Well, yes, but despite the massive power, this is only around 48% throttle. Max throttle would produce 7,590 metric tons, too much for the launch mount hold clamps, hence why the booster is throttled down for static fire tests. In addition to static fire testing of Booster 9, we saw a full speed test of the Starship Quick Disconnect arm, as part of the steps required to have all systems ready for launch. So when will the next orbital launch take place? So far it's looking like as little as under two weeks away. This is based on a recent notice to Mariners that SpaceX filed with the US Coast Guard, which details whereabouts any rocket operations will be taking place and where areas of potential debris will be. Crucially, this document states that the next Starship launch will be on approximately the 8th of September, or in other words, next Friday. In addition to this, SpaceX's license with the FCC will be renewed OK on the 7th of September, so the only thing left is a launch license. Now, lack of launch license right now isn't a sign that it might cause a delay. Remember, SpaceX didn't have a license to launch Booster 7 and Ship 24 until end of business the day before, so it's not like we all need to be holding our collective breaths right now. Here's to keeping fingers crossed for the 8th. Demolition work at the build site continues. The rapid expansion of the Star Factory building continues on, rendering the tents obsolete. Last week, we covered the tearing down of Tent 2, and last week, we said goodbye to Tent 1 as well, with the structure coming down on Saturday. This was shortly followed by the mid-bay. We saw the beginning of this building's destruction over a week ago now. Perhaps demolition had to wait until Tent 1 was out of the way. Whatever the reason, it was curtains for this building in the early hours of today, as we saw the whole structure come crashing down, ending its roughly three-year life at Starbase. Nearby, at the Rocket Garden, Ship 28 continued receiving its engines. Last Monday, we saw the installation of Vacuum Raptor engine serial number 225, thanks to Jack Bear from NASA Spaceflight for this time-lapse footage of the engine installation. 
As for the next ship in line for testing, we saw ship 30 lifted onto a transport stand in the high bay on Wednesday, indicating an imminent move to the Macy's testing site for cryogenic proofing. Starbase at Roberts Road remains at a relative standstill. We haven't really seen any change in the Starship launch tower hardware since the last time we saw Greg Scott conduct a flyover of the area. But thanks to a recent flyover by NASA Spaceflight, we can now see that there is a fourth tower segment over here. These much smaller tower segments are not for Starship, but rather will form the crew access tower for Kennedy's Launch Complex 40, which Falcon 9 currently launches non-human payloads from. By adding an access tower, NASA and SpaceX will have a second launch pad from which they can launch Crew Dragon, should anything happen to Launch Pad 39A. You know, the one that's right next to the new Starship launch pad. <laughs> it now looks like all tower segments are structurally complete, with only their interiors needing finishing up. SpaceX were not just doing amazing things with Starship last week, but we were also treated to three Falcon 9 missions, two Starlink, one Crew Dragon. The Starlink launches took place on Tuesday and Sunday, the first taking place at the Vandenberg Launch Complex 4E. The Falcon carried 21 Starlink V2 minis on Mission Group 7-1, and all satellites deployed successfully. The first stage landed on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship in the Pacific Ocean shortly after stage separation, wrapping up its 15th overall flight. Wow, these boosters are clocking up a lot of missions. Sunday's Starlink mission was Starlink Group 6-11 and launched from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40. The payload was 22 Starlink V2 minis, which were delivered to orbit successfully, and shortly after stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage successfully landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. This was a newer first stage booster, having previously supported just two missions, Axiom 2 and ESA Euclid. I think the most exciting Falcon 9 launch of the week had to be the launch of Crew 7. In the early hours of Saturday, NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbili, ESA astronaut Andreas Mogensen, JAXA astronaut Satoshi Furukawa, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov all boarded the SpaceX Crew Dragon Endurance at Launch Complex 39A. We then saw the Falcon 9 make a successful liftoff, carrying the crew to the International Space Station. Mogensen served as the pilot for the Crew Dragon spacecraft, making him the first non-American to fulfill this role. Furthermore, in late September, he'll take command of the space station, the sixth European to do so. As the Crew Dragon hurtled into space, the Falcon 9 first stage performed a successful landing burn following stage separation, landing at Landing Zone 1 at Cape Canaveral. After a short cruise through space, the Crew Dragon autonomously docked to the International Space Station on the space-facing port of the Harmony module, and the hatch was opened just two hours later, with the existing crew of the station welcoming Crew 7 aboard. SpaceX do great work making recovery and reuse of orbital class boosters look so routine, it's a shame that no other company has pulled it off yet. Rocket Lab, however, made a big advancement in making Electron reusable last week. Yep, we saw another red band electron rolled out to the pad at the Mahia Peninsula last week. The red band on the first stage indicates that the mission is a recovery mission. But that's not all. This was the first time an electron was fitted with a previously flown engine. Here's a photo of the rocket's business end. Can you spot the Rutherford engine that's been flown before? Hint, it's that sooty one at 7 o'clock. <laughs> it was taken from the recovered first stage booster from Rocket Lab's There and Back Again mission in May last year. How would the engine perform in Rocket Lab's We Love the Nightlife mission, the first of four dedicated missions for Capella Space? Well, as you can see, all engines ignited successfully on the 23rd of August, and the rocket cleared the pad fine. In fact, the entire mission went by without any issues, successfully delivering the Acadia 1 Earth observation satellite to low Earth orbit. The first stage made a successful parachute-assisted splashdown shortly following stage separation, and CEO Peter Beck tweeted that the successful use of a previously flown Rutherford engine means that the next step for Rocket Lab will be to fly nine reused engines on an upcoming mission. Now, I wouldn't expect that one anytime soon. It was about a year and a half between missions for this reflown Rutherford, and Rocket Lab have stated that a recovered Rutherford must undergo the same rigorous qualification and acceptance testing as a new Rutherford. Here's a clip from the full hot fire test of the reflown engine that featured in last week's mission. 
if engine reuse wasn't already enough of an achievement for Rocket Lab, last week's launch also brought the total number of electron launches to 40. 39 orbital and one suborbital. Man, I forgot about that haste electron variant. <laughs> Congratulations to Rocket Lab on 40 launches. I can't wait for the next 40. One company that's older than both Rocket Lab and SpaceX is Blue Origin, and yet they've still not got an orbital class rocket. But that's quickly changing. NASA spaceflight caught images of a new Glenn test tank hooked up to some ropes in a rig very similar to SpaceX's Cam Crusher rig. These ropes will contract, pulling a plate down onto the top of the tank to simulate the forces of flight. Blue Origin are unfortunately a lot more secretive with what goes on behind factory doors, so it's harder to determine how far along New Glenn is. But last week, NASA boss Bill Nelson visited the factory, and we saw lots of barrel and dome segments in the background of some of the photos he tweeted, as well as what looks like a New Glenn first stage. Hopefully, we won't have to wait too much longer to finally see New Glenn rolled out. Last week didn't just see crew arrivals at the International Space Station, we also saw the delivery of more cargo. This followed the recent departure of the Roscosmos Progress MS-22 cargo spacecraft, which undocked from the International Space Station's Vesta service module last Sunday. Two days later, on Tuesday the 22nd of August, we saw the launch of Progress MS-24, carried by a Soyuz 2.1A from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The spacecraft docked to the station successfully two days later, delivering cargo, food and water to the crew. While Roscosmos were successful in delivering cargo to the International Space Station, they weren't successful in landing their Luna 25 spacecraft on the southern pole of the moon, which crashed following a loss of contact after it encountered problems moving into its pre-landing orbit. All eyes were therefore on the Luna 25's Indian rival, the Chandrayaan-3. Apologies for the need to use cat footage for this, people are apparently still getting hit with copyright claims for showing Indian space footage. Anyway, the spacecraft deorbited on the 23rd of August before making the descent down towards the lunar surface. The footage isn't great sadly, it looks like it uses resampling which is causing blurring, but the important thing is that the landing was a success, with the spacecraft successfully touching down in the lunar south pole region, the first spacecraft to land on the south pole in history or at least land in one piece. <laughs> After landing, the spacecraft deployed a small ramp and then its onboard rover rolled out. The rover will be used to take measurements of the lunar surface's composition, the presence of water ice in the lunar soil, history of lunar impacts and the evolution of the moon's atmosphere. The lunar south pole region was selected for the landing site since this area holds particular scientific interest because the mountainous terrain casts a lot of shadows, protecting water ice from melting and therefore could be used as a source of drinking water and hydrogen for fuel and oxygen for future lunar outposts and missions. The expected mission life for this lander and rover is one lunar daylight period or 14 Earth days. It's not all success stories this week though. North Korea once again attempted to launch its Cholima 1 rocket. It's pretty hard to find footage of North Korean rocket ops for obvious reasons, so all I have is this looped footage of what purports to be the one and only other Cholima 1 launch, which uh, also ended in failure. The first launch of Cholima 1 took place in May this year, when it attempted to place the military reconnaissance satellite Malig Yong 1, which translates to Telescope 1, into low Earth orbit. However, the mission failed when the second stage ignited prematurely, causing the rocket to crash into the Yellow Sea. Last week, the mission was re-attempted, with the rocket carrying a new reconnaissance satellite. This time it got a little bit further, but then it experienced an unintended activation of its flight termination system during the flight of the third stage, which obviously destroyed the rocket and its payload. China was a bit more successful with launches last week. A Ceres-1 rocket launched the Jilin-1 Kuanfu 02A satellite, great name, <laughs> from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center last Friday. Official sources have stated that the satellite, which is also known as the Hong Kong University of Space and Technology Xiongbing-1, so not that much more concise, is a large, wide, high-resolution, multi-spectral optical remote sensing satellite. The mission went well, and the satellite was successfully placed into sun-synchronous low-Earth orbit. 
Cloud Aerospace had another busy week of launches. I sent two crews of four to the surface of the Mun in Kerbal Space Program 2 and in Kerbal Space Program 1 with mods, with the objective being to investigate how the games compare, how smoothly the missions go, and I don't know, just have fun, I guess. <laughs> I've already made big progress with this Saturday's Kerbal video as well. It's going to be one of my most ambitious and uh, PC performance sapping missions I've undertaken in Kerbal Space Program 2 yet. I'm going to show you a quick snippet of that video to give you a sneak preview. Are you ready? So yeah, so there you are. Yeah, bet you're excited now. Make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss it. And of course, I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you did, do leave a like down below because it really helps support what I do here. And of course, huge thanks to all my Patreon and YouTube channel members. Your support means the absolute world to me. There are two videos on my channel on screen as well. Hopefully there's a good picks there from my channels. So hopefully Hopefully I, I would have thought they would be good, you know, just as stumbling now, aren't I, to get to the end of the video. Uh, otherwise, thank you all so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next video, which uh, is Saturday. I already, I already said that. Okay, bye.